This is a bin full of Commodore 64s, and every single one of them is dead. Let's see if we can do something about that right now in episode, doesn't matter, of Retro Bits. Repairing a broken Commodore 64 is a YouTube rite of passage. And I made my first attempt last week during a live stream with the help from many of you guys in chat. Now, it's probably not the smartest thing to attempt my first repair live, and I messed up a bunch of times along the way, but we got there together in the end, and we were able to fix this disembodied longboard that had multiple failures, including a dead 6510 CPU, a dead PLA, and a bunch of oxidized sockets. So this is gonna be a little different from previous episodes as I'm going to make use of my live streaming configuration today while it's still set up. So let me reach down here into the bin and pull out another Commodore 64 and we will start trying to troubleshoot this machine. Now what we've got here of course is a Commodore 64 bread bin. This one looks to be a relatively early example just judging by the keycaps and the F key color here, I mean, you never know what you're gonna get until you open it up, but um, it's pretty browned, a little bit yellowed everywhere, a little bit dusty, but otherwise in good physical condition. And there doesn't seem to be anything broken. There's the serial number there. Nothing exciting about this machine from the outside. So let's get it opened up and see what's going on on the inside. Okay, there, I've removed the three Phillips head screws. Now, the secret to getting a Commodore 64 open is you gently lift the top. Now these were designed to open like the hood of a car, but the three catches in the back become brittle over time, and if you open it too far, they'll snap. So what you do is you pull the front towards you, and then you can lift it away. And, oh, look there, the uh, catches have already been broken. The case is broken here, the case is broken there. One snap is intact here, but oh, it isn't intact, that one's also broken. So this case has been opened uh, violently before and all of the catches have already been broken open. Now that's pretty common for bread bins and they do sell repair parts so you can repair these catches if you want, but just be careful when you open bread bins, always pull the front towards you, don't lift it up like the hood of a car. All right, what we've got here is the traditional paper RF shield with this little foil sticker and so we can just peel that back. And there we go. This is a Commodore 64 Rev C 251137. And we can see right away that all we have is a single socketed chip here. The SID, the 6581 SID is socketed and the VIC-2 underneath this can will be socketed. Unfortunately, nothing else appears to be socketed on this machine. Interesting, we have all MOS chips here except for this one, which has, it's still a MOS chip, but it has a different logo on it. It doesn't have the graphic logo, it just has the printed text logo. These chips are from 82, 83, 82, 83, 83, and then the 6510 is from 84. I'm wondering if this hasn't been replaced since it looks different than all the other MOS chips and it's a year later. Interesting, I guess we'll find out. All right, I've removed all of the screws to get it out of the case, and I've noticed that one of the standoffs here is just broken because the screw is spinning in place. So if I remove the board here, yep, we can see that we've got a, you can't see, there we go, a broken standoff there. And then on this side over here, we have a broken kind of piece of plastic, plus the, the catch is broken here. So this case isn't in great condition, but you know it's all right from the exterior, it's not too bad. So I'm just gonna set the case out of the way here. All right, so this board has a metal RF shield, and those shields are not just kind of clipped or screwed into place. They're actually soldered into place in a whole bunch of places. So you have two options. One thing you can do is you can just cut these little metal fingers that wrap around and then solder on. I'm just gonna heat up my desoldering gun, and I'm going to try and desolder all of this as best as I can and just try and lift them out of the way without having to cut them. I'm not gonna put the RF shield back on later, I'm just going to detach it now and give the owner the option of putting it back on later if he wants to, so I'm not going to destructively remove it.
Now there certainly is a good case for just cutting these off because that's a tremendous amount of solder I just removed and we still haven't gotten a single clip out. What I'm going to try and do now is use my little screwdriver with the soldering iron, heat them up and pry them out one at a time. That's what I'm going to try anyway. Ah, there we go, I got one. Yeah, it's a pain because this ground plane absorbs a lot of the heat, so it takes a long time to get them kind of warm enough to loosen up. Plus, you need to be working it with two hands, which is a challenge. And there's really nowhere to apply a good amount of pressure without like risking pushing down on the board somewhere you don't want to, so. Ah, two down. All right, here's something I found. It might be easier if your intent on keeping these tabs intact is to add a little fresh solder or flux and just warm up that solder and then use a very fine tip set of tweezers to try and work your way under the tab. It seems to work better than my big screwdriver and it gets under there a little bit easier. And then that fresh solder gets the thing released a bit easier than the other methods I've been trying. So maybe there's a tip there, but probably just cutting these off is probably your best solution. There we go, I've got all of the tabs released, so now the RF shield should come away from the board, assuming I've got them all. Oh, there's one more here on the RF modulator that I didn't see. Let me just heat that up. There we go. Did I see something come out? Yep, there's that uh, broken standoff right there. It's flattened. <laughs> Interesting. All right, let's have a closer look at this board now that we've got it free of the RF shield. Again, the only socketed chip here is the 6581 SID. Actually, there is a socketed chip over here too next to the RAM modules. This is the LM556. I guess that's probably a timer, but that's not a MOS chip. I don't know why that one would be socketed. Um, looks like all eight RAM modules are from Oki, so we're not dealing with uh, MT RAM or MOS Tech RAM or anything like that. These uh, SM Logic 74LS Logic chips aren't made by MOS, so that's also a good sign. So in general, we're looking at a pretty non-interesting board. There doesn't seem to be anything that jumps out at me right away as being immediately wrong. Of course, we don't know what's wrong with it since we haven't actually plugged it in yet. Let's just take a quick look at the back side and see if there's anything going on back here. Oh, it looks pretty, pretty normal to me. It doesn't look like any of the stuff in this area has been reworked. I don't see any signs of obvious rework at all. There is some old flux kind of kicking around here. I'm wondering if perhaps all that old flux is kind of nearby the RF modulator. I'm wondering, and there's a marking here, A1. I don't know if that's from the factory or if this RF modulator has been reworked at some point. But no, I think it's just there's a lot of flux near these heavy solder points where there's a lot of structural solder. I think that's all that we're, we're seeing there. I don't see any other repairs or any signs of uh, rework otherwise. So what I think we should do now is connect it up to a display and see what we can see. And then we'll test the common stuff like the voltage regulators and we'll test the fuse here and make sure that everything looks good. But I'm curious what's going on with this machine. So I'm gonna plug in the video cable here. I'm gonna plug in the power cable and I've got this 90 degree bend here. Actually, you can't see it, there we go. Got that 90 degree bend. Makes it easy to uh, keep all your cables kind of going in the same direction, which is nice. And the problem is, is I got the one that doesn't have the uh, DIN, the full DIN connector, it's just pins. So it's not as easy to line up. The, the full one is a little bit more expensive, but I probably should have opted for that one instead, just so that I can make sure that I've got all the pins in the right place when I do connect it. All right, let's switch over to our capture device and see what happens when we flip the switch. Ah, the familiar black screen, okay. Well, we've got the white bar across the left of the screen, which indicates to us that we're generating an NTSC signal and the VIC is running. But other than that, we've got another black screen, which is, you know, pretty common. That's what we had with the last board too. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the multimeter and we're gonna do some initial testing here and see what's going on. All right, I've got my multimeter here. The power is turned off. Let's just test continuity across the fuse. We should have good continuity on the fuse because we saw that there was video coming out of the VIC too. So of course that's good. I'm gonna set it to DC voltage now and flip the power on. 
And let's check the power coming out of these two voltage regulators here. This one should be five volts. Yep, and indeed it is. Can you see that? It is 5.00 volts, and this one should be 12 volts. And 12.26, uh, a little bit higher than I'd like to see, but I think that should still be fine. So we've got five volts and 12 volts. So we've got enough power on this board. We don't have any problems there. The switch is working, the fuse is good, and the voltage regulators are good. So I think the next thing that we should do is probably slot in the dead test cartridge and see what we've got there. So as before, I have my Versa 64 cart that I built a long time ago. I made a whole episode about that. And this is a multi-cart that I've got an EEPROM on here with the dead test the Commodore 64 and 128 diagnostic cartridges and a couple of game images, and you can just select them with jumpers. So this is really useful to have. I'm just going to make sure the power is off and throw that in here like so. And let's fire up the dead test and see what we've got. All right, here we go. I'm gonna flip the switch. Heard a little pop from the audio. We've got that black line. We don't have any flashing. Normally, if it started flashing right away, it would indicate there's a bad RAM chip or something like that. It takes a few seconds for the uh, the screen to come up if it's going to do anything at all or if it's just going to sit here and show us a black screen, which it looks like it's going to. It doesn't look like it's going to do anything. Okay, so it's not running any code or it's unable to run any kind of code. Now, I mentioned this before, but the dead test cartridge runs in Ultimax mode, so it does not need the CIAs, the basic kernel or character ROMs to be working, doesn't need the SID. All it really needs to be working is the CPU, the VIC, the PLA, and there's a 4K of RAM in Ultimax mode that's uh, required. But none of that matters if you just get a black screen. We need to dig in a little bit deeper. And the problem with this board, of course, is there's no sockets anywhere. So we can't reduce it to a minimum configuration. Normally, it would be nice to remove all of the chips we don't need, including all three of these ROMs and the two CIAs, as well as the SID chip, and that would help us troubleshoot and diagnose individually which chips are, are the problem. But unfortunately, we can't do that. So what I'm going to have to do is, well, first of all, I can remove the SID chip. That's the only thing that I can remove. So let's try removing that and see if that makes any difference. It probably won't, but you know it's socketed, so let's have a look at that. And I've got my little screwdriver here. I don't have a fancy chip removal tool. I do have a crappy chip removal tool, which I don't like to use because it's not very accurate. I find that with basic hand tools and being very careful, you can get them out just fine without bending any pins. All right, got the 6581 SID chip out. Let's see if that makes any difference. Nope, doesn't appear to be. We're not getting any flashing. We're not getting any indication that the thing is going to come to life. All right, well, we got to dig in deeper, so let me get out my scope and let's start probing some lines and see if we're getting a clock signal coming out of the VIC-2. Let's see if we're getting any conflicts with the chip select signals coming out of the PLA. That's usually the first thing we suspect when these machines don't work at all, is that we've got either a bad CPU or a bad PLA. So let's start diagnosing there. You know, before we dig out the scope and start looking at signals, let's just do some of the very basic stuff. I've got the power on still, and I'm just going to feel all the chips to see if any of them are getting unreasonably hot. That's usually a very good indication you've got a short, but none of the RAM chips feel hot. None of the LS Logic chips feel hot. PLA always feels warm but it's not scalding to the touch, it's just warm, and they always run warm. CPU is also warm, warm to the touch. Not quite as warm as the PLA, but it's definitely warm. ROM chips, nothing exciting there. CIAs, nothing exciting there. Okay, so there's no smoking gun in terms of chips that are obviously shorted out. So I guess the next thing we need to do is dig out the oscilloscope and start looking at some, some traces. All right, in order to do that, we need a schematic. And here I am at Zimmers.net. This site is hosted by Bo Zimmerman, who was on the live stream, and I forgot to thank him for making this resource available. So let me do that right now. Thanks, Bo, for making this available. We were using it during the live stream, and it's a dead useful resource. It's got all of the schematics for all of the different Commodore revisions here. Now, what we've got is a 250407 Rev C board, and I found 250407 Rev A. Um, schematic diagram 251138. Well, we've got a 251137 Rev C. It's not quite the same as the one listed here, but hopefully it is 
similar or you know the same as the one listed here. So I'm going to take a look at this schematic and let's see if we can't do some identification of what the traces are coming to the CPU. I'd like to see if the CPU is receiving a good clock signal. Now, I assume the clock circuitry in the VIC can is working because we do have an NTSC signal coming out of it, but let's see if we're getting a solid one megahertz signal coming into the phi clock of the CPU. That's the first thing I wanna test. So let's find the CPU here on the diagram. There are two separate pages, and it looks like this is the one we care about here. So let's see what's going on with the 6510 MPU. All right, what I see here on pin one is phi zero in. That's the one we're interested in. We've got phi here, phi in, and then the phi two comes out here. So let's measure the clock signal coming into the CPU on pin one and take a look if that's good. All right, I've got my Handtech handheld oscilloscope 2D72. It's kind of an older model, but um, it gets the job done. I would have it hooked up to the PC, but the PC software over USB has a very, very high latency or uh, very, very low refresh rate, like one hertz. So it's not very good used on the PC, so you're just gonna have to see it on camera here. I've got the probe set up properly this time. I found that in the last live stream, that I had connected this to the PC software and it had reset the probe to 1x when I had the probe set to 10x. And so at first, all the measurements were wrong and I thought the reset signal was no good on the board itself, but it was actually the way the uh, software had changed the settings on the oscilloscope. And one of the um, live viewers in the chat pointed that out to me and saved the day. So we've got a working 10x probe configured properly here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna probe the phi signal coming into the CPU and in order to do that, what I wanna do is go here onto the channel and I'm going to go to measurements and I'm gonna turn on the peak to peak and I'm gonna turn on the frequency. Let's see if we can do that here. Okay, frequency and peak to peak voltage are now enabled. I'm gonna set the probe onto pin one. Here we go, and I'm gonna turn it on. All right, we definitely have a signal there. 1.02 megahertz and 4.4 volts peak to peak. So it looks like we have a good phi zero clock coming out of the VIC and coming into the CPU. So that is good. That's the first thing you need to have a machine that runs. So that is a nice sign. Um, the next thing I wanna check for are chip select signals coming out of the PLA. That's what got us last time is that we had a dead CPU, but we also had a dead PLA. And the PLA was selecting multiple ROM chips at the same time, even though we were booting into Ultimax mode. Let me just break in for a minute and talk a little bit about how the Commodore 64 dead test cartridge works. It takes advantage of the fact that the Commodore 64 is backwards compatible with its predecessor, the Japanese-only Max machine. Now, the Max machine has a VIC-2, a SID chip, and a CPU, but it does not have the CIA's kernel ROM, basic ROM, or character ROM, and it only has four kilobytes of RAM. So the Commodore 64 is fully backwards compatible with the Max machine, and the dead test cartridge takes advantage of the fact. It boots the Commodore 64 into the Ultimax mode by expressing the game and XROM lines correctly on the expansion port. And so the Commodore boots up into a very minimal configuration, which allows you to test things without having those other chips in the way to interfere with what's running off of the cartridge. Anyway, I thought that would be interesting to those of you who haven't heard it before. I did mention this on the live stream, but for those of you who weren't there for the live stream, now you know. Okay, moving on. So I'm gonna take a look at the chip select signals coming into the three ROM chips or coming out of the PLA, and we'll see what that looks like. So first of all, I've gotta go over here. All right, I found U17 on the diagram. That's the PLA chip. And if we look here, we have the basic chip select signal here on pin 17. The kernel select on pin 16, it looks like and the character ROM here on pin 15. So we want to probe 15, 16, and 17 and see what those look like. All right, so this is the PLA and it is a 28 pin dip package. So we've got 14 pins here. So pin 15 will be right here. Let me get the probe on that and then I will switch the power back on. Okay, what we've got is a high if you can see here on the probe, on the scope, we've got uh, two volts per division. So it looks like that line is being pulled high, which is good. Um, we wanna see that. It doesn't look like it's five volts, but 
being pulled high is the normal unselected state. These things get selected when they're pulled low. So let's look at the next one. Okay, same thing. And the last one. Okay, same thing. So we don't seem to have any chip select going on, which is what we expect to see when we've got the dead test cartridge in and we're booting into Ultimax mode. So that's a good sign. We don't have the same failure coming out of the PLA as we did on the last machine. So that's nice. Now I was curious why I wasn't seeing a full five volts when I was looking at the two volts per division on the scope. So I added an additional measurement. Now I've got the uh, VMAX here. And if I jump on to the pin one again here, or I'm sorry, pin uh, 15, and I measure that, I've got VMAX at 3.76 volts. Now, when the chip select signal is pulled high into its default unselected state, you would expect to see five volts here. So the fact that we're seeing 3.6 volts and on this one, we're seeing 3.5 volts. And on this one, we're seeing 3.9 volts. Something is pulling this signal lower than it should, or the PLA isn't able to generate a full 5 volts. I don't think 3.9 volts is enough to select the chip. But still, I would like to be seeing higher voltages coming out of this, this chip because you want all of those lines to stay high when you're booting the machine in Ultimax mode. So that's interesting. Something to look for. One thing I forgot that we should always check before we troubleshoot anything else is the reset line. We want to see that that's working properly. And if we look here on the CPU, here at pin 40, we can see we've got the reset line. And it should normally be held high, except when the machine is in reset, and then it should be dipping low for just a second. So let me get the probe on to pin 40, which is the very last pin on the CPU here. And I will flip the power switch, and what we should see is that it should go low for a second and then flip high. Yep, that looks good. One more time. Yep, okay, reset line is working, so we've eliminated that as a possibility as well. So right now we're still kind of suspecting that the PLA might not be working properly. So what I've done is I've removed the dead test cartridge and I'm gonna turn the machine on without it and I want to probe the chip select lines here on the basic character and kernel ROM um, because we should see some activity there. Now, the first one here is the kernel ROM. I'm going to probe it. It's right in the middle, one, two, three, four, five, pin 20. And can you see that? There's plenty of activity here on the chip select line for the kernel ROM, which is what we would expect. Now I'm going to probe the character ROM, one, two, three, four, five. I don't know if you can see that, but there are occasional bursts of activity, so it is getting selected on occasion, um, which is fine. It shouldn't, I guess, be active all the time. And then let's take a look at the basic ROM, one, two, three, four, five. And the basic ROM, there's no activity on it. Now, I guess that's probably fine because there's no, nothing running, there's no code running on the machine. But when we power cycle the machine, we should see some activity on the chip select line for the basic ROM and there's absolutely none. When we power the machine up, it's either not booting into a state where it's requesting the basic ROM, or the PLA isn't doing the right thing and switching the basic ROM into memory, uh, or, or rather making it available when it needs to be. So the chip select line uh, on the basic ROM is suspect, and I'm not sure if it's still the PLA or not, but realistically, we can't run the machine without a working PLA, uh, 6510 CPU or a VIC chip. And we know that the VIC2 is sort of working because it is generating the Phi 0 for the CPU correctly and it is outputting an NTSC signal. But we haven't popped the can open yet. So let's do that and maybe the first thing we should do is just reseat the VIC chip, spray some contact cleaner in there if it's in a socket, it probably is. And then we should start troubleshooting the CPU next. I'm not clearing the PLA of being a suspect, but we should test the data lines and address lines on the CPU next before we go to desoldering and anything like that. All right, I've popped the can off the VIC-2 here and I'm just gonna spray some contact cleaner in here. As before, we've always got to clear bad contacts on these sockets of being a possibility. Because if you remember the K-Pro episode, I had a bad disc controller and I spent hours trying to figure out why the machine wasn't working properly. I disassembled the disk drive so many times, swapped them around, and really it was just the legs on one of the chips that was in a socket that needed to be cleaned. So let's get that contact cleaner in there. We'll reseat the VIC-2. Even though we suspect this is working okay, it doesn't hurt to check that out. And one other thing I wanna do 
is I want to throw some contact cleaner here in the cartridge slot because if there's any corrosion there, oxidation, it may be preventing our cartridge from working properly and I want to stem that off. There we go. And I'm going to insert my cartridge a few times just to work it in. All right, let's test the dead test again just to see if that made any difference. All right, here we go. I don't suspect this will make any difference, but we've got to rule out these possibilities, and these are the easy, low-hanging fruit, so let's just do that. It can take up to 20 seconds for the dead test to show up if it's going to work, but I don't think it's going to work. Okay, I've waited about 20 seconds, nothing has changed, so it's still not working. So we either really are suspecting that the PLA is bad or the CPU is bad. So the next thing I'm going to do is check the data lines and address lines on the CPU. All right, in our diagram, our data lines on the CPU are here, and they are on pin 37, counting down from D0 to pin 30, so on D7. So let's check those first. All right, so the CPU is a 40-pin package, so we've got pin 40, 39, 38, and 37 right here. Let me flip the power switch. All right, we've got what looks like some activity on this data line. But let me zoom in a little bit here. All right, I don't know if you can see that, but it looks like we've got some crosstalk here. I've got this on two volts per division, so a high should be two and a half, and we can see some high signals flying by there. But for the most part, there's a bunch of gibberish kind of in the middle. So we're not getting a good data stream here. We should see either high or low, but it looks like more than one thing is trying to talk on the data bus at the same time. Let's look at some of these other lines. So we're on D7, let's look at D6. Kind of looks like the same situation there. D5, D4, D3. D3 is looking a little bit better. There's less crosstalk. D2, that's looking weird. And D1 and D0. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at the address lines. Here we've got address line zero at pin seven, and then counting up eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, all the way up to pin 23. So let's start here on pin seven and just take a look at what the address lines are doing. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. Okay, that looks good. Okay, so it looks like the address lines in general are doing the right thing, but it looks like there's some crosstalk on the data line, which makes me think that there are multiple things being selected at the same time when they shouldn't be. So again, that all points back to the PLA not doing what it should be doing. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna desolder this PLA and let's test that out first because that seems to be generally and usually the obvious candidate here. We've seen a couple different things indicating this could be the problem. And so that's what I'm gonna start with. Let's get this thing out of here. Now I already discussed what the PLA does in the live stream, but just for those of you who are joining us for the first time, PLA stands for Programmable Logic Array, and its job is to take signals from the CPU and the cartridge port and use them to select the memory map of the machine. Of course, the 6510 CPU can only talk to 64K of addressable memory at, at one time. And we have a full 64K of RAM, but we also have ROM chips, for basic character kernel, we have cartridges, we have registers on these other things here. So at any given time, the CPU needs to see different chips on the board, and so the PLA will decide which chips can be active on the bus at any given time. And when we're seeing some kind of bus contention where multiple things are trying to talk at the same time, it indicates that the PLA is allowing multiple chips to talk at once when it shouldn't be. So that's why I suspect this guy here. All right, this is U17, the PLA here, and I'm going to desolder it first, and then we'll see if that gets it all out or if I have to use hot air next. All right, that came out pretty good. There were a few holes that didn't clear, so I'm gonna add a little bit more solder and try again on just those holes. Now it is desoldered pretty well, but sometimes the solder can wick up through the holes and make connections on the top side as well. 
And in order to really get it loose, we're probably going to want to use some hot air. The last thing we want to do is pull up a trace or a pad. So what I've got here is this little chip removal tool. And this thing is just like really flimsy spring steel, but it allows you to lift a chip without putting enough force on it that could damage a trace or a pad. So let's just see if I can sneak it in here. And, oh, okay, one side came out, no problem. Let's see if the other side comes out. And this just comes with the hot air removal tool. I didn't buy this special for this. It's just something that I had. Yeah, I don't want to pull too hard on this. I've got one side completely out, but the other side is stuck a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my hot air and I'm just going to apply a little bit of hot air to this while I lift it gently with the removal tool here. Yep, there we go. Hot chip. Yeah, and you can see here that there's a little bit of solder that had whipped up and there were a few solder blobs here. So I'm just gonna grab my desoldering gun and get rid of those guys. But yeah, otherwise, that looks really good. I don't see any problems with that. So what we're gonna do is I'm going to socket this thing and then we're gonna try an aftermarket PLA in here and see if that works. Before we socket it though, I'm just gonna clean up the mess I made before. A little IPA here and Q-tip. Get rid of some of that flux and that old gunk. Best to have a nice clean surface before you start. There we go. All right, got my new socket here. Just gonna make sure that it aligns up with the notch. Goes right in, nice and easy there. And the way we like to solder these in is to start one pin at the top, one pin at the bottom, and then push from the other side and make sure that it's making good contact and flush with the board. And if you're not careful, you'll burn yourself. Yep, there we go, that wasn't making good contact, now it is, and that one is good. Okay, just finish this up. And there we go. All right, what I've got here is the Plankton, and this is a replacement PLA that I took out of my own bread bin machine, and this is, you know, a modern replacement. I tested this just the other day, so I know it works. I'm just gonna slip it into the socket here. All right, there we go. And let's connect up the video. And we'll connect up the power. What do you think? Boot it into basic or boot it with the dead test? Let's boot it into basic and see what happens. No such luck. Still got a black screen. Okay, that's not a good sign. Let me throw in the dead test and we'll see what we've got with that. Dead test is in. And we'll wait the 20 seconds or so it takes to see if anything at all happens. Nope, doesn't look like anything is going to happen. We still have a dead Commodore 64, even with the new PLA in place. All right, so that's not good. What I want to do now is take the old PLA and test it in my working bread bin, just to confirm that it is working, or we may just have a second fault here. All right, here we go. Okay, so the PLA from that machine does seem to be working. My machine did boot and yeah, so I was barking up the wrong tree. That is unfortunate. Usually it is this if it's gonna be anything, but that kind of tells me if it's not this and it's not the VIC-2, which we don't really suspect at this point, that it could be the 6510. And that would suck because we've already had one board with a bad 6510 in the live stream those things are getting harder and harder to find. They don't make new 6510s, but you can adapt a new 6502. But I hope it's not the 6510. Anyway, well, that's a bummer. It is what it is. All right, so we're looking at the CPU again, since we're not sure if that's what's bad. And I'm probing the data lines. They start at seven and they go all the way to 23, skipping 21. But if we look at pin seven, that data line's looking pretty good. Looks like normal traffic, looks like the normal levels. 
19. What's going on with 19? Those look like triangles, not squares. Yeah, that doesn't look right at all to me. 20? Nothing going on on pin 20. And we skip 21, pin 22. Nothing going on on 22. And nothing going on on 23. So either something that is feeding data into the CPU is wrong here, or something's going on with the CPU. But we're not seeing any data on these lower or upper pins. And this one looks like it's completely garbage. Pin 19 looks like it's completely garbage. If we take a look at the schematic, pin 19 is address 12, and then pin 20 is 13, we skip 21, 22 is 14, and 23 is 15. So we're having some sort of weird thing going on on A12 to A15. Interesting. Now what's also really weird is that A12 to A15 are the only address lines that are directly connected to U17, the PLA. Now, because I'm seeing weird results on those four lines, that would cause me right away to suspect the PLA, but we've already replaced it. So we know that the PLA is good. And so it's not the PLA that's causing whatever's going on on these address lines to be weird. Could be the CPU or it could be something else. I'm gonna keep looking at the schematic and see what else I can find. All right, so I've been probing all of the chip select lines on the CIAs and the three ROMs and none of them are selected when the dead test is in. So they are not trying to talk on the bus. The data lines look fine across the board. I've checked the all of the RAM, I've checked the data lines on all of the ROMs and the CIAs and they all look fine. The only thing that's weird is the high address lines on the CPU. I can't find anything else on this board that may be affecting the address line since all these other chips are not selected and when you're booting into Ultimax mode, really it's the VIC, it's the PLA, and it's the CPU. Now I hate to think that it could be another bad CPU, but that's where I'm leaning right now. So I'm gonna desolder this and then we're gonna test this CPU in my machine and see if the CPU works or not. So stand by. All right, same as before, I'm going to try and use my little chip lifter here and see if we can't get this out without too much force. Kind of fiddly getting this thing inserted underneath the legs. Oh, okay, one side came out without any problems. There was a little pop, but I didn't put any amount of pressure on it, so let's try this side. Huh, once again, one side wants to come out, the other side doesn't. So I'll switch on my hot air and we will just do it that way. Same as before. And as before, I'll just clean up my desoldering here. Just make sure these holes are nice. Came out real clean. All right, same as last time, I've got my Evo 64 out here. We're gonna use this to test the CPU because it's got ZIF sockets, which makes it really easy just to take out the good CPU and put the one we're about to test in sure we've got the pins lined up. Make sure we've got pin one where it belongs. Close it off and that's all there is to it. Let's plug this thing in and test it out. Oops, I left my 90 degree connector on the other motherboard. All right guys, what do you think? Place your bets. Is this CPU gonna work in the Evo 64? Let's find out. Oh no. Oh no, we have another dead CPU. What are the chances of having two dead 6510 CPUs? This is terrible, because these are not easy or cheap to replace, unless you use a modern equivalent. That is unfortunate. We have a dead CPU, guys. Number two. All right, so all that stands now is to put my good CPU in the test board and see if that fixes the problem. Stand by.
All right, guys, I've got my good CPU from my bread bin, and I'm going to put it in this brand new socket, and let's see what we've got. Sure, we don't have any bent legs. That's always a problem. Okay, it's in there. Let me hook it up, and let's see what we've got. All right, we know we have a good CPU from my machine. We know the PLA works because we tested it in my machine, and we suspect the VIC is good because it's drawing the white border and generating the phi signal for the CPU. So I'm not gonna plug in the dead test. Let's just flip the switch and see what happens. Haha, -ha, there we go. Commodore 64 basic, 38,911 bytes free. So we have another dead CPU. That is a massive bummer. I wish it was something easy. I wish it was a simple RAM chip or even a PLA where you can get any number of cheap replacements, but not the 6510. That sucks. Well, you know what that means, guys? It's time to mark it off. Here's the bad 6510. Here's the Sharpie. There's the X. Job done. All right, next thing to do is to hook up the full diagnostic harness and run the machine through its paces. Let me get the SID reinstalled so we won't get any spurious errors with the controller ports. And speaking of spurious errors, I learned during the live stream recently that you should really clean the user port and the tape port in order to run the full diagnostic or you may get invalid results. It may show errors where there truly aren't errors. So I am going to apply a little bit of IPA to both of these and just take my cotton swab here and just rub these down in case there's any oxidation because this did cause some problems when I ran the full diagnostic very recently. I'll do the same thing on the other side. These ones look good. The other machine, the other board that we worked on was really dirty. This board doesn't look that bad at all. It's not dusty, it's not dirty, and it doesn't look oxidized, not too bad. Actually, there's a little bit on the Q-tip here. So there was some, there was some oxidation, some dirt here, but not nearly as much as the other one. These are nice and shiny, so yeah. All right, let's get that harness installed. All right, here it is. This is the harness that I built way back in an earlier episode, and it's all set up. All we have to do is plug it in. All right, there we go. The full harness is installed. Let's flip the switch and see what happens. Oh, of course, <laughs> I would need to put in the diagnostic cartridge, wouldn't I? All right, I've got my Ultimate 2 Plus right here. It's got the diagnostic cartridge on it. Slot that in there, and let's try that instead. Here we go. All right, looking better. Got the full diagnostic. Got the RAM test going on here. Keeping our fingers crossed that nothing else is wrong with this machine. Kernel ROM bad, but everything else is checking out. And we've got the sound. Second voice. Got to check all three. Third voice. Voice. All right, guys, I think this is a good C64. Now, the reason it says the kernel ROM is bad is simply because the checksum of this ROM doesn't match the checksum that the cartridge is expecting. It doesn't mean the ROM itself is bad or the code on it is bad. It could just be a newer version or an older version than this particular diagnostic cartridge is expecting. But everything else passed, and if you notice down here, we've got the two counters, the 122 AM, and 1.22 p.m., that means the clocks on both of the CIA chips are working and they're in sync. So everything about this Commodore 64 is good. Of course, before we can call this machine fixed, it does need a new CPU. This is my CPU and it won't stay in this machine. But before I put everything back together, I wanna to clean off this old thermal compound from the VIC-2 because it is dry and crusty and that's not gonna do anybody any good. So I've got a little IPA on a paper towel here. Let's just wipe that right off. I'm also gonna wipe it right off of the little finger here, the heat sink on the lid. All right, that's good. 
And I'll just take my thermal compound and apply a little bit here. A little new compound. Oh, comes out fast. Just spread it around a little bit here. Now I can reinstall the can. That finger will press right down there on that chip. Great. All right, I've got the motherboard installed back in its case. We've got a complete C64 here. I've got the Ultimate 2 Plus installed. And I think what we should do before we wrap this up is put this computer through its paces and just make sure it's working for real. So let's do that. First thing I wanna do is just fire up a demo on the Ultimate 2 Plus here. So let me go to the demos folder here. And this is an NTSC machine, which means it can't run all that many of the really cool demos out there. But I can load this file into the REU, and then let's just run this program. There we go. This thing does crazy amounts of DMA transfer from the REU into main memory in order to do that rotating globe animation. So you know your memory is working properly if this thing runs. Plus we've got good SID music on the, uh, the backing track. All right, so next up, I think we should try a game. And what I'm gonna fire up now is something that just came out recently. It's called Yeti Mountain. And this is fun. I played it all the way through from start to finish. So here we go. We've got some of the elements of the overworld here where we can walk around and we can solve some mysteries. Early game, don't have any skis yet. Let's see what else this game has to offer. Of course, we've got platforming. And power-ups. We've also got boss fights. Got a downhill skiing section. All right, I think that pretty much wraps it up for the day. This Commodore 64 is fully working and we've put it through its paces. So that's another one out of the bin that we can check off the list. It is a bummer about this 6510 CPU though. I was hoping it would be something easier like a PLA or a RAM chip that you can easily get replacements for. But that's two dead CPUs in a row. That is a real bummer. Anyway, you may have noticed that today's video is a lot more informal than the usual type of stuff that I make. I don't plan to continue doing stuff like this a lot, but if you do like this new format, please consider hitting that like button and let me know in the comments. If you didn't like it, still hit that like button and let me know you appreciated the attempt. Then leave a comment letting me know what I can do better next time. If you'd like to support the channel, consider joining our Patreon or as a YouTube channel member. Both get ad-free early access to videos, and channel members have their names highlighted in the comments and get access to special emotes. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Retro Bits.